Colonel Charles Simpson, USAF, retired, served 30 years as an Air Force officer, mostly in Air Force missile systems. He graduated from the University of Miami at, in Florida in 1959 and worked for a short time as a designer at Pratt Whitney Aircraft before entering active duty as an aircraft maintenance officer at LG Hanscom Field uh, in Massachusetts in 1959. In 1961, he began missile training in, in Titan I and served three years as a missile maintenance officer at Mountain Home Air Force Base in Idaho. Then spent five years as a missile launch officer in Miniman II at Grand Forks Air Force Base in North Dakota. During that stay, he was part of a 12-man team that won the Blanchard Trophy as the best missile wing in the Strategic Air Command at the annual missile combat competition. He spent three years uh, in the Strategic Air, three years in a Minuteman Command, as a Minuteman Command Evaluator, traveling to all the Minuteman wings twice a year, then four years at headquarters of SAC, assessing missile accuracy and reliability. After Air War College, he was commander of the 68th Strategic Missile Squadron, assistant deputy commander for operations in the 44th Strategic Missile Wing, and base commander at Ellsworth Air Force Base in South Dakota. He was then the base commander at Comiso Air, uh, Air Base in Sicily, a new ground launch cruise missile base where he oversaw opening of the base and the missile wing in, in Cyrillic, is that correct? In Cyrillic. In Cyrillic. Uh, okay. In Cyrillic Air Force Base in Turkey, uh, Zaragoza Air Force Base, Air, Air Base in Spain. His final assignment was as Chief of Staff, 57th Air Division, um, Minot Air Force Base in North Dakota. Charlie. This year, I'll be retired 30 years, so I'm at the point where I'm waiting for free now, totally, I guess. Yeah. Uh, this briefing is one of several in our library at the Association of Air Force Missile Leaders on a variety of subjects that impact the history of uh, Air Force Missile Leaders. And this one is especially important to us because of the topic it's about. Uh, the event this is about is really the point that we matured in the ICBM Force and was very early in our lifetime. Can't hear me? Pardon? Yeah, I can take up higher on Is that better? A little more? Okay. One, two, three, test. Test. How's that? Again. Uh, test one, two, three. Is that okay? Good. Okay. That's too much. <laughs> this briefing is about the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. Uh, we put a special patch together, I'll talk about it a little later in the briefing, but uh, we talk about it from the standpoint of oops. Push the wrong button there somewhere. Is your home? Up and down. Well, I jumped all the way to the end of it. There we go. Uh, we call this for the Cuban Missile Crisis, Air Force Missile Air Sack, and DEFCON 2. Uh, pretty important in our history of, of not just Air Force Missile Air, but of the United States. I want to say it upside down, that's what we'll do. Before I start the briefing, let me talk about where I was in October 1962 first. Uh, I had been in the Air Force a little less than three years. Uh, it was a non missile maintenance. I ran an operation called Missile Job Control, which was a maintenance organization that watched the maintenance at our three missile sites. In Tank 1, we had nine ICBMs, uh, three at each site, with radio guided. So we had to have three missiles per site because we only had one guidance system for every three missiles. Uh, we had the missiles less than five months when the Cuban crisis started. 
most of the ICBM squadrons got their inventory from the contractor, both Atlas and Titan, during 1962. So we were all very new with this brand new system, which uh, was pretty complex, a lot of moving parts, hazardous, a lot of liquids that made, did funny things, like exploded occasionally, uh, a lot of things to fail, very unreliable, very tough to maintain. A Titan I squadron and an Atlas squadron were very similar, had about 800 people in it. In the case of the Titan I squadron, about 80% of those were maintenance people. So a lot of people to maintain nine missiles. Almost 100 people per missile to maintain nine missiles. It took a lot of work. A lot more than it takes for the current ICBM force. I'm supposed to have a hair, hair trigger. <laughs> I gave this presentation uh, once this, uh, to a large group down at Forestdale uh, Air Force Base in uh, Freeport as part of the annual Air Force Global Strike Command Challenge, which is the annual bombing and missile competition. Uh, starting in 2010, the new command, AFDSC, combined the bomb comp and the missile comp into one, one event every year. And part of that event included a symposium uh, for all the competitors, uh, featuring a number of very good speakers from around the country talking about topics involved with nuclear weapons, Air Force history, nuclear history, and the future of bombers and missiles. Uh, I gave this one to an audience of about 850 young enlisted and officers. Uh, most of them were either bomber or missile crew members, bomber or missile maintainers, security forces, and others involved in support directly of the ICBM and bomber force. And they were at Barksdale to decide who was the best in the command as far as the best bomber crew, the best missile crew, and all of that. So it was a pretty interesting audience. They paid pretty close attention to, to the uh, presentation I gave. And I'll start it like I did with them. I started off by saying that 50 years ago today, meaning 50 years ago then in October 2012, if you were a bomber crew member today, you'd be one of three places, and only three places. You might be one of 65 crews flying a B-52 loaded with nuclear weapons around the perimeter of the Soviet Union, waiting for the gold code. You might be, if you're not one of those 65, one of the hundreds of crews on alert in B-47s, B-52s, and B-58s in bases around the country in alert facilities or in civilian airports or overseas sitting ready to go to war. You're sitting in an armed airplane or sitting in an alert facility. If you weren't one of those two places, you are only one other place. You were home in bed resting to go to one of those two places tomorrow. We were in, in an advanced in a condition of readiness we were on the war footing, nobody was on leave, nobody was on TDY, nobody was out playing golf or fishing. We were either working or resting to go back to work. If you were a missile crew member, you only had two choices. Either you were sitting in one of our new launch control centers, about 200 of them, scattered around the country, and you were home resting to go out tomorrow to take the place of the guys out there then. I say guys because we had no, no women in those days. If you were a missile maintainer, a bomber maintainer, a security forces member, or anybody else that was a mission essential person in the Air Force, you were one of two places again. Either you were working a 12-hour shift, a 24-hour shift, a 36-hour shift, a 48-hour shift, or you were home resting to take the place that people were working today. Either you're working or you're resting, and that was it. If you're a non-mission essential, people like MWR, admin, things like that, you were an augmentee for mission essential people. We were on a war footing. We were as close to nuclear war as we've ever been in our country, and everybody was ready to go and focus on what the mission was. How did we get there? Throughout 61 and 1962, there were several things that happened to the Soviets that got the attention of our leadership. Uh, they were arming Cuba, they were trying to move weapons into Cuba, but nobody was sure exactly what the Soviets were doing yet. Uh, we did, we did find out they were trying to move offensive, offensive weapons, uh, and that bothered President Kennedy and the senior staff. On the 14th of October 1962, President Kennedy was shown uh, aerial photographs taken by U-2s of Soviet medium-range ballistic missiles, two different kinds, with their warheads, with 35,000 troops, and also with a number of medium-range Soviet bombers on the ground in Cuba quickly approaching operational readiness. It looked like these systems would be ready to attack the United States within about five to ten days. 
They have threatened about half the United States. They have covered a lot of our country with the missile from Cuba. Of course, that caused great concern. Now, at this time, nobody else knew about this but the senior leadership of our country. We didn't know about the military. President Kennedy formed a group he called the XCOM, the Executive Committee. He was a mixture of his national security staff, his cabinet, and a few close friends. And they began meeting often to talk about what are we going to do to solve this problem. We've got to somehow get the Soviets to back off against to get the missiles out of Cuba. How are we going to do this? They looked at several options, which right away one was we can go in with a massive air attack, we can take out all the, all the Soviet systems, uh, we can do it with either conventional nuclear weapons, we can do a ground invasion, amphibious or airborne or a combination thereof, or we can do both of those together, or we can put, do a massive blockade of Cuba with the Navy and stop all in and out traffic moving the island. Uh, they talked about that for several days, trying to decide what to do. We'll talk more and later about what really happened. Let's take a look at SAC in 1963. The main, the main command was nuclear weapons. Uh, in 1962, the Navy didn't have very much yet in the way of nuclear weapons. Most of our nuclear deterrent force was in SAC. Uh, we did have some fighters overseas with uh, Victor Alert with nukes and some other systems. But the primary part of our uh, force was SAC. In 1962, SAC was almost as big as the whole Air Force is today. The Air Force now is with over 300,000 people. SAC had 280,000 people in 1962. We had 639 brand new B-52s scattered around the country. We had 547 brand new Hound-Dog cruise missiles, nuclear tip, medium range attack missiles. It was pretty awesome force right there, but that's not all of it. We had over 880 B-47 bombers still on alert to carry nuclear weapons plus 146 more B-47s for special missions like electronic surveillance, comm relay, recon, things like that. Some of those airplanes were constantly deployed in Europe and in the Pacific on alert, called reflex. So we had alert airplanes all over the world all the time. We also had 79 supersonic bombers, the B-58, and two bases in the States. So we had a lot of power just with our, our bomber fleet in 1962. To support those, we had a lot of tankers, a whole lot of tankers. We still had about over 500 KC-97 propeller-driven tankers. They were slowly being phased out. We had over 500 brand new KC-135s and more coming in the inventory. So a very large tanker force. And our recon at that time was basically the U-2. We didn't have much of the way of satellite reconnaissance yet that was very good. Uh, we didn't have drones. And we had 42 U-2s at the way out of deal. It was a very busy year for, that, for those of us in missiles. As I mentioned earlier, we got most of our new missiles during that year. A lot of missile squadrons got a lot of missiles. Thousands of us were in training over the last few months or during that year at uh, Shepard Air Force Base in Texas, at Chinooda in Illinois, or at Vandenberg in California, preparing the duty of missiles. Or we were on base at New Systems. Uh, we had gotten our missiles, all of us, except for a few sites. I think Plattsburgh was the last one. Uh, they've gotten their missiles uh, turned over about the time of the Cuban crisis. Most of us had our missiles in hand and had them combat ready more or less. Uh, we weren't sure yet in some cases, they weren't very reliable, but we were trying to make them work the best we could. We also had a lot of Matador and Mays cruise missiles still in Europe and in the Pacific. Over 500 of these nuclear armed, medium range cruise missiles targeted to the uh, western side of the Soviet Union from the Europe and eastern side from the Pacific. And, you know, they were at several bases and we were training for those in Orlando and Patrick and we test launched, in those days we test launched uh, that drill in Mace down in Libya. Our air defense at the time in the Air Force was primarily BOMAR, which was a nuclear tip or conventional tip, uh, ramjet powered vessel. There were a number of sites along the northern tier and in Canada. Uh, Bomber was designed primarily to shoot down formations of Russian bombers. It wasn't really for a single bomber, it was to go up and pop off a new and take out a whole bunch at one time. We also had some intermediate range missiles on the list. Uh, we had three squadrons of four missiles, 
uh, we paired with the RAF in England, uh, a joint operation, and three squadrons of Jupiter in Italy and Turkey that we, we ran in conjunction with the Italians and the Turks. Uh, these missiles had about a 1500 mile range, they were also nuclear armed. So we did have a few medium range IRBMs at the time. The oldest ICBM was Atlas B. Uh, three squadrons, plus the missiles at Vandenberg, some above ground, some in, in semi hardened coffins. The missile laid horizontally on alert, had to be raised vertically and then loaded with RP 1 and fuel and then launched. Had a nuclear warhead of about four megatons, was guided by radar guidance, and it took about 15 minutes to launch the first missile. We also had three squadrons of the Atlas E missile. A little better than the Atlas D, uh, again, laid down horizontally on a coffin, a uh, uh, hardened structure, had to be raised vertically to be uh, low to the locks in RP-1. It, it had inertial guidance it, so it could, uh, a little better guidance system. We had six squadrons of Atlas Self missiles, all brand new. Uh, the Atlas Self, uh, which was housed in a vertical silo below ground, to be launched, you had to be filled with liquid oxygen, raised above ground, and then it launched even in the guidance system. Again, it took about 15 minutes to launch each one of the missiles. They weren't as quick to response as many men were later on. Six bases, again, we had the Trinity of Vandenberg and Little Flights of Vandenberg. Titan 1 that I was in, six more squadrons, and the missiles of Vandenberg. The Titan 1, we had nine missiles per squadron, three missiles per site, radio guided. Again, uh, vertical silos had to be filled with locks below ground, raised above ground to launch, guided by the radar system on the site, so we could launch only one missile at a time of the, of the three of the site. You had, to, you had to launch one to its target and wait for that, that missile to end its power flight before you went back and launch a second. So the response time was not really quick. Things started happening for us in the military on Saturday, October 20th. I was sitting in missile job control that morning. We were preparing one of our missiles at Mount Home for a lock loading exercise. We had to exercise every missile every 90 days. Uh, a lock loading exercise meant we had to take the RP-1, the kerosene, off the missile, prepare the missile by taking all the ordnance off of it, all the explosive ordnance, put TV cameras in a bunch of locations around a silo and watch some of the electronic racks, make sure everything was ready to go. And the next day, we would do a countdown, low liquid oxygen, raise the missile topside, lock the guidance system on, and do a complete launch to power, power flight in simulation. Then it took us another day to bring the missile back on alert again, put the RP-1 back on, we the ordinance, clean up the mess from all the things we've done, put the cameras out. And that's if the thing worked right the first time. Uh, about two-thirds of the time, they did. About a third of the time, they failed. And we had to do it again, or again, and again until we got it right. So sometimes they set off alert for a number of days. It was a massive effort. We were preparing one of our missiles that Saturday morning to exercise on Monday. I got a call from the Wing Command Post, the 9th Bomber at Mount Home. We and the missile squad were part of the 9th Bomber. I got a call from the, uh, the 9th Bomber, a major, he said, Lieutenant, SAC Underground Senior Controller just called me and said, tell you to put your missile back on alert right now do not ask questions, do it. That's it. I hung up, it sounded pretty impressive to me. I, I, I called out to the missile site, I talked to Major Ted Grossholz, who was our main supervisor, in charge of the team out there preparing Charlie Free for the exercise. And I said, sir, we've got to put Charlie Free back to work right now. He said, I can't do that without the authorization. Not even more than that. I said, sir, that's between you and the command post. He hung up, he called me back in about 30 seconds, he said, we have been alert in three hours. He said, I don't know what's going on, but it must be important. And they were very direct with it. So we started putting the missile back on alert. We got word that shortly after that, to keep everything on alert, don't take it off unless you absolutely have to, and keep every missile on alert from now on until you fully notice. We also were told to recall all the people and leave in TDY. That's pretty unusual to do that. We did a, we did a squadron recall. We were put on 24 hour man on the whole base. I walked outdoors out of our hangar. We were in a nose dock on the flight line, and this was what it was. There were B-47s powered up everywhere, and PC-97. B-47 being loaded with nuclear weapons, PC-97 being loaded with equipment and personnel, and airplanes were screaming off the base. 
Mm -hmm. By the next day, every airplane in Mountain Home was gone. Over 180 airplanes had left the base in that short period, going somewhere else. We didn't know where. We got very quiet in the base after that. Was just us missile folks there. We got our first intel briefing on Sunday. We were finally told it wasn't something in Egypt, it wasn't something in Africa, it wasn't something somewhere else in the world. It was missiles in Cuba. That's what the problem was, and that's what we had to pay attention to. So we now knew what the, what the threat was. We learned a lot more on Monday when President Kennedy got on television, on national television, and addressed the nation. Uh, if you haven't seen that address, it was very direct. He uh, outlined what we had found. He showed the, uh, the photographs that were taken by the U-2. He stated that if, if the Soviets strike any target anywhere in this hemisphere, they are considered a, an attack on the United States and we will retaliate fully with the nuclear forces. And he went on to say that he had decided the action I'm going to take right now is to quarantine Cuba. No attack, no air attack, no ground attack. But he did say we have a lot of forces in Florida my wife Carol was accustomed to that. Her family had been mine at the time. Florida was about to sink in the way of the Army and the fighter planes down there, I think. Uh, ready to go into Cuba if we had to. But the main, the main solution was the quarantine, the island of Cuba, to stop all traffic going in, and then to start working on cruise ship to get rid of these vessels. The B-47s, we discovered, were dispersed to civilian airports around the country or overseas. I've talked to uh, B-47 crew members since then who spent three to four weeks on alert in places like Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport, or Portland Airport, or Logan Airport, places like that. They had a fully loaded B-47, they had a full complement of maintenance people and security, and they had enough crews to provide 24-hour coverage. One of the fellows that I talked to said he would spend four hours in the cockpit and go and sit in the terminal for eight hours to rest and eat, and go back in the cockpit four hours. For three weeks he did that. Sitting ready to go to war from a commercial airport that was out of country. The rest of the airplanes, the B-40s, were at home on alert. Except airborne alert went from 18 in the air all the time. We used to have what's called chrome dome, where we had 18 airplanes flying with nuclear weapons on alert. We went to 65 in the air during the Cuban crisis. So there were 65 B-52s airborne 24 hours a day flying along the front of the Soviet Union ready to go in and attack if the mood did. The rest of the forest was, was on alert and ready to go. The recce flights were increased substantially, uh, not only the U-2s, but we, uh, we had uh, Navy and Air Force assets and reconnaissance airplanes, everything we had at the time to, to see what's going on in Cuba, to find out what, what really was happening down there. The Bandera and Mace is were on full alert in, in Europe. But they were pointed towards the Soviet Union, ready to go. I talked to several of our, our members of our association who were in Maddor and Mace at that time, and they were as tense as we were over there, ready to go to war. For the ICBMs, we had one crew at the consoles 24 hours a day, at the consoles. We had a second crew on the site resting, either the bedroom, the lounge, the, the TV lounge, the, the dining room. If one of the People at the console had to go to the bathroom or had to take a break for some reason. He couldn't leave with somebody to this place. There had to be four crew members sitting at the console ready to react immediately for that whole time and sat on alert for about three and a half weeks. So we had two crews on, on site all the time. What that meant for us was almost constant back-to-back -back alerts. We had about in home 16 combat crews. We had three sites. It took six crews to have those three sites. That takes 12 crews every two days. Doesn't leave very many of them for time off, does it? So they were pretty busy. They were coming and going. If somebody got sick, it really messed up the schedule. So we were, we were told again and emphasized one more time, maximize alert. Don't take missiles down to do daily checks. Don't take missiles down to look to see if there's something going on. Fix it with it sitting there on alert. Leave it, leave it, let it go. Here's a typical Type 1 crew, uh, four people. The man in the middle with the 38th pistol in his hip is the uh, crew commander, the launch officer. This console has three rows of, of buttons across it, one for each one of the missiles. The first button starts launch loading, the next button raises the launcher, the last button launches it. There was no key, there were push buttons. Uh, the man in the front is the guidance officer. 
this job and it's the next missile to go up, what's through the TV monitor and lock the guidance antenna on that missile and then crank up the guidance system and drive that missile to the start. It took about four and a half minutes to have to lock you know, the guidance system for its independent flight. Then he had to go back and find the next missile and lock on in and do the same thing. The two fellows in the back were the two enlisted members of part of the team. The BMAT, the Ballistic Missile Analyst Technician, sat in the console and monitored the status of every, every system in the complex. The powerhouse, uh, the three silos, the equipment terminals, the, the antenna, security, everything. He had all sorts of indications to watch and a lot of communications to do it. The other fellow was the Missile Maintenance Technician. He normally stood during a launch sequence up by those monitors you see on the back of the picture. He could look at a black and white TV screen that was a picture of an electronic rack in a silo. He could tell on a black and white TV screen what color a full color light was on a black and white TV set. The lights were red, green, yellow, and white. He could tell what color it was on a black and white TV set. That told him what valves were open, what valves were closed, what was going on. As I said, they had to stay at the console. Somebody had to be at the console during this whole time. 24 hours a day. There was a bedroom just off to the, behind us on the right here where the crew could sleep normally. Uh, normally two guys could sleep and two could sit in the console. But not during this period. There's that was a missile, all on alert, and it's coughing, uh, ready to go. So it, it made it horizontal. It had to be raised vertically first and filled with RP-1 kerosene and liquid oxygen and then lost. The crew, when I was seeing, was right next door in the blockhouse, not very far away. Miniman was still not quite done yet. Uh, the wing at Malmstrom was the closest. It was probably four to five months away from being the first missile turned over. It was constructed at Malmstrom and other places, but it wasn't planned to become operational until later in 1963. Uh, President Kennedy called in General LeMay and said, can you get me a Miniman missile in the next few days? And the mayor said, sir, I'll go find out and I'll let you know. And uh, it would take a massive effort, no doubt. So the mayor left and went to work. Wednesday, things changed again drastically. We now went from DEFCON 3, which we were in before, to DEFCON 2. DEFCON 3, when President Kennedy spoke, we went, we went to that with the normal method of a coded message in the primary alerting system. That's the SAC telephone system that goes to every missile crew, every bomber, in every command post. Uh, not this time. This time, General Thomas Power got on the, picked up the red telephone in the South Underground, and he personally told everybody out in the open, we are going to Defense Condition 2 right now. We are doing it because of the Cuban crisis. Follow your checklist, do it right, do it safely, and do it quickly. If you have any questions, call me or call your commander. That's pretty direct when you're sitting there on alert in a, in a cockpit of an airplane or a missile who wants to control center and here the four star telling you directly, hey, we're in defense condition too. We're pretty close to looking at war. So we train for this all the time, but we never expected to go anywhere near that during our, our career in missiles. So it was, if anything, it got much more intense around the Air Force Base. The whole Air Force went to that at that time. On Friday, something almost miraculous happened. General Amay went in to say to the Kennedy and said, I can give you 10 Miniman missiles. You'll have the first one on alert today. Today. It was four days after he was told that he put them on alert. Uh, the contractor, Boeing Company, and the other contractor involved, and the missile wing got together, and using a combination of Air Force resources and contract resources, they were able to first put Alpha 6 on alert that Friday afternoon, and then the rest of Alpha flight on over the next few days. And a pretty impressive thing to do for a system that was supposed to be ready in five to six hundred months. Uh, in 2012, we had our national convention in Great Falls, Montana, to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Cuban crisis. This ceremony was conducted at Alpha 6. The site was over to the right side, which passed the telephone pole. The first Miniman site on alert in 1962. There's a big national park sign out in front of it, as a matter of fact, that announces that. We had in the audience, uh, besides the high powered Air Force people like the commander of uh, Global Strike Command, the commander of uh, US Strategic Command, 
and about three or four other four stars and a bunch of other generals. We had chiefs and master sergeants who had been young airmen announced in 1962 and put that missile on work. One of our board members, Joe Andrew, was a young two striker. He was involved with that process. We had a three-star general named Leo Smith, who was the last vice commander of SAC, who in 1962 was a lieutenant on assignment from B-52s to Minuteman to get his master's degree. And he was one of the first crew members on alert at, at the Monster Patrol Center for the Alpha for six. And they were in the audience. We had 700 people show up for our little ceremony. A pretty impressive ceremony to commemorate a pretty important event. Over the next few days, uh, things happened. Uh, I won't go into great detail, but there was a lot of talk back and forth between President Kennedy and uh, Khrushchev. Uh, in those days, it was mostly talked by teletypes. Uh, there were some handwritten letters, too. There was really no direct telephone line where they could sit and talk to each other. They, they could talk to each other, but it, it took forever to set it up. Uh, not like it is today. Uh, they went back and forth with several discussions about how to do this, how to back out of this. As you know, in the end, uh, we did. There were a few missteps along the way. Uh, somebody wasn't very smart in the Air Force, and we launched a couple of test missions in Vanderbilt. I don't know why you would do that in an advanced defense condition. You know, you think the, the Russian fire saw that really got worried because here's an LSF lifting off out of Vandenberg, and we're in F gun too. Uh, it wasn't smart. Uh, the Soviets made a serious mistake. They shot down our U 2. They didn't mean to. They, they made some mistakes and they shot it down. They killed the pilot, they moved off Anderson. Uh, we had a U-2, another one was getting lost over the Arctic Circle. Almost put in the Soviet airspace. And luckily, uh, I think a B-52 found him on his radar and then turned around. His, his magnetic compass had gotten screwed up and he got, got lost. We had some ships bumped into each other, Russian and American ships, in a quarantine. Luckily, nothing happened serious. It was amazing considering how edgy we were at the time, if I told you were to war, there's nothing more serious than that happened. There's a lot of things that came close. Of course, you know that Kennedy and Khrushchev finally agreed on our solution. Uh, Khrushchev would take the missiles and the bombers and the people out of Cuba for the next few days. And we would do something that we didn't talk about publicly, but we did under the table, basically. We removed those missiles in Turkey, one squadron of, of, um, of Jupiter. They were planning to be phased out anyway in 1963, so it wasn't any big deal for us. But the Russians didn't watch because they were pointing towards Russia. So that was our concession, just to phase those out. Jupiter wasn't a very good system anyway, so it was no big loss. We slowly got back to normal, if we ever got back to normal. I, I'm not sure we got back to the normal we had before this. Uh, we maintained F-3 and the F-2 until 20 November which was the day before Thanksgiving, 1962. But they didn't let us get off alert until about a year after that. I think somebody decided at a pretty high level, if you let 280,000 people who are going to work in 24-hour shifts take off on a four-day weekend, you're going to lose 100,000 of them traffic accidents and sporting accidents and things like that. So let's keep all these young folks at work for four more days. So we sat on alert over Thanksgiving, uh, knowing that the crisis was basically due to but we took it easy in the So it was over. But I don't think we ever got back to really a total full normal that we had before. We had gone through a pretty important crisis. Uh, we had matured greatly in both bombers and missiles. We actually lived what we had trained for for, for, for uh, starting this new system. So now we knew we could really do it if we had to. I was asked uh, at the Global Strike presentation by this big group of 150 young enlisted officers. Uh, and the question can, could that happen today? Could the Russians or somebody else sneak missiles into some place close to us and threaten us? And I don't think it could. I think there's several reasons. Number one, look at our recon today compared to 1962. We have so many different ways to look at what's going on around the world that's instantaneous now. But you wouldn't you wouldn't sneak in a bunch of missiles or people into a, a strange country. Uh, we've added things like drones since then, too, and, and all kinds of other things. We also have many more options down both nuclear options to, uh, to handle situations like this on both sides. Uh, so it's not the need to do something sneaky like that. We have much better ways to handle situations like that. And more importantly, I think, we're much better with conventional force now than we were in there. Nowadays, we've got Tomahawk cruise missiles off of uh, submarines and destroyers. We've got uh, 
drones and carry weapons, do all kinds of things that can, can do pinpoint accuracy destruction of targets. So if you're going to hide some missiles in Cuba, we're going to take them out and not bother anybody else. It just, it just wouldn't happen because of that. The communications are much better, as I mentioned. Uh, Khrushchev and Kennedy had to talk by teletype, basically. Now, uh, people can talk directly by cell phone, probably if they need to. If, they, if Putin needs to talk to, to Trump, he can do it right away. And finally, social media. I don't think you can do anything sneaky anymore. I think anything you try to do in the way of shipping things out of Russia or anywhere else would be on the internet so fast the whole world would know about it. So you couldn't hide anything like that anymore. It's just a different world than it was in 1962. Let me talk about a couple of films and books about this, uh, this whole thing. The first one really isn't about the human crisis, but it's more about what SAC was like in 1962 and 63. I think it was probably filmed before the Cuban crisis. It came out in the theaters in 1963. Uh, it was a movie called Gathering Legals. It starred Rock Hudson and Rod Taylor, of all people. It was about a B-52 wing with a Titan One missile squad at a Vito Air Force Base in California, trying to pass an ORI. And it was very realistic. Uh, it talked about the problems they had with the SAC IG, how mean he was when he came in, uh, all the no-notice things. Uh, the most impressive scene in the movie to me is the two stars standing beside the runway field watching a MITO takeoff, a minimum window takeoff, of 15 B-52s lifting off one after another 15 seconds apart. They filmed a real MITO takeoff in the movie. It's impressive watching that. It's on the internet, as a matter of fact, on Facebook, just a, a takeoff. The other one uh, is the best summary of the Cuban crisis I've ever seen. I watched it numerous times. It was a documentary drama for television starring some very, very well-known actors. Uh, it was on TV for several nights in 1974. They used the actual transcripts of the XCOM. They used the chronology of events for the Cuban crisis. It's not very dramatic from the standpoint of airplanes flying around and bombers and things like that, but it's very factual and very straightforward and very truthful about what it was really like. Most of what happened was in closed rooms, people talking about it, while we sat on the learning. It's a very good movie to watch uh, about President Kennedy and the XCOM and the Soviet and all the things that happened to resolve the crisis. And it's available. I, I bought a copy a couple years ago. And it's available to the platform. Reading, uh, we have an AAFM in our files, a whole lot of Cuban information. Uh, we've got some CDs that available to, to people for small donation that has a whole lot of data about the Cuban crisis. Uh, papers, chronologies, uh, transcripts, books, everything about it. Uh, probably the best place to go is there because that's all facts. There have been some books written. Uh, we did one ourselves. Uh, hundreds of our members sat down in 19 in 2012 and wrote personal stories about your experience in the Cuban crisis. I have a story in there, my wife has a story in there, uh, and many of them. Uh, I meant to bring a few copies with me and I'll look at my guest. If you want to download that book off the internet, uh, you go to afmissileers.com slash cubabook.pdf, all small letters, cubabook. You can download it for free. Uh, you can't remember that, ask you later, or email me at afm at q.com, I'll tell you how to download it. It's really some very good stories about what life was like as a young enlisted guy, an officer, a wife, a kid, a civilian who saw it from the outside. It's really true stories about those days in 1962. The last one I got involved with really was Michael Dobbs. Uh, anybody know who Michael Dobbs is? You watch House of Cards? He wrote House of Cards. He called me in uh, early 2012 when he had a book about the Cuban crisis. And I gave him a list of several members to talk to who were involved with it like I was. And he talked back and forth a couple of times. Then he sent me a draft of his book. He decided that the whole thing was settled by two people, Khrushchev and uh, Castro. Kennedy wasn't a player in this whole crisis at all. Neither was an American military. We just kind of stood by and watched. The real heroes were Khrushchev and Castro. He said several things that, that happened never really happened. Like uh, Dean Rust commented about we stood eyeball to eyeball with the Soviets and they blinked. That never happened, Bob said. Uh, that brightened me a little bit, and I told him that. And what really got me was he lied to me. Uh, he had an interview in his book with one of our board members, Joe Andrew, I mentioned earlier, who was at Mountain. 
And I called Joe and I said, how was your discussion with Mr. Dobbs? He said, you never talked to me. So what he says he did in his book. You know, I called Michael back. And, well, I didn't have time, so I, I found a little article in a, an old time magazine. That's what the interview was. I said, so you lied in your book. How much more of it lies? He hung up and he never talked to me. <laughs> so I, I don't recommend it, it, it. It's a history, but I don't recommend it as a, as a good history of the kid crisis. And the price of other ones that are better. We put this patch together, one of our members did, uh, for our 2012 meeting to represent the systems and the missile side of the house that were involved in the crisis. We did all of our missile systems, including the 91 base, and uh, just a little souvenir of the crisis. What's the ace of space for? Uh, that's the ace of the hole. I, I didn't mention that. One of the things that President Kennedy said during a speech when we have to that came on word is, I now have Minuteman with missiles on alert in this crisis. That is my ace of the hole. That is now the official motto of the 12th Missile Squadron in Alpha. They are the aces in the hole. And the ace of spades is their, their symbol on their patch. And we uh, thank President Kevin for that. So that's my presentation. And I'd be glad to answer any questions. Folks, uh, we are filming this, so please uh, put up your hand. We'll give you the mic so the film can actually hear your question. Thank you for your uh, your review. Um, from my perspective, I, I know about DEF CON from a movie called War Games. And there was a picture you showed of four uh, operators where one guy had a gun, and then that movie that came out in the 80s, the, the, the one guy turns the other guy who won't turn his key and says, turn your key, sir, turn your key. Um, can you talk about any aspect from the perspective of where you are now in your life and what occurred then, obviously, following orders and what was required at the time and saying, well, that was a different time, the perspective was different. But the insanity of the whole system of what potentially could have gone wrong if there was a 737 uh, aircraft that was in control of, and what I mean by that, the computer system is telling the operators this is what you need to do, and a bunch of people die because of that, that circumstance. It sounds like a lot of situations may have occurred where we dodged a bullet, and we're very fortunate today to be all be living because of that, but anything that you can talk about where you are now from, from looking back let me talk about the 38 first. Um, we all had 38, not just one guy. We all were, and they were not there to point at the other guy. They were there to keep anybody trying to get into our capsule. Now, to me, it was a waste of a, a weapon. I complained about it. We had to learn how to shoot a 38, 50 yards, and fast reload. I was inside a, a 35 foot long capsule and only had six bullets. So why do you have to get these training for this time? But it, it was there to look for defense. Actually, escape, actually. Uh, Let's go back to it, because we were trained over and over and over and over again. So we knew exactly what we had to do. One of the things that General May started this was that you were in SAC in those days. Everything we did, we did by a checklist, a very detailed checklist. Nothing was done by this. It was turn the page, read the steps, allow, do the action. Every step was done that way. And that was true throughout the whole command all the way to the top. Everything was done with at least two people. Nothing was done alone. You know, the nuclear weapons, we had two officer policy and two non policy books. So nothing was done by one single person. Everything was well thought out. Everything was, was tested over and over again. Uh, I had no doubt I could do it if I had to. I didn't want to. I would tell people, when they'd ask me, would it bother me to be at ground zero and to have the power to launch over nuclear weapons? I would say, you're at ground zero. I'm underground in a secure silo. I'm safe. And my job really is to make sure we never launch these weapons, not that we do as fast as we can. If we do our job properly, we will never launch a nuclear weapon. And it's worked for a long time. Uh, there were things that happened over the years. Um, most of them, in my opinion, got blown way out of proportion to what really happened. War games could never have happened like that. Uh, there were some things where uh, there was a case where a wrong tape got put in a computer written already one time, and it, it created some problems that, that caused a little upset and they did increase the readiness quickly for a very short time. But people started checking it all and everything required a personal check before taking the next step. Nothing was automatic. 
Uh, I think they even went so far that time to take the key out of the red safe, which happened maybe three times over the last 60 years. Uh, we didn't even do that back in the few days. We had to be ready to. Uh, my, my opinion always was that none of those things got close enough, and we, we understood enough, and we asked questions. And we, we did put the checklist in, but we also knew that, number one, we were taught over and over, we don't expect to have a bolt out of the blue. We don't think we're going to go to war instantaneously. If we don't go into nuclear war, it's going to be a long-term thing where something has happened here and here and here, and we start building up, like the Cuban crisis. And it was not overnight, it built up. You know, the idea that you've seen, like in Failsafe, or uh, one of my favorite movies is Dr. Strangelove. Uh, it, couldn't, it couldn't happen that way. In fact, we were at the hotel that night, it was on TV, and I looked over and that channel didn't work, so I couldn't watch it. I love that movie. No, it's, it's, it's humorous, it's great. But uh, my, my feeling was, as a young lieutenant, as a captain, as a colonel throughout, that we are smart enough, and we know what's going on enough, that those kind of things couldn't happen. There are enough safeguards. Uh, when I was at SAC headquarters, my job was to assess if we go to war, how many missiles we get off the ground and get to the target. And our big concern was, we have so many safeguards, some are not going to make it because of that. I mean, there are safeguards there that are going to keep us from launching missiles when we really want to launch them. So that was more of a concern to really do the job because of that. It never, it never bothered us in, the, us in the business, I don't think. There were, were exceptions. I had a deputy who became a peace protester. Uh, we go off my crew very quickly when that happened. We drove Vietnam. We had a few of those over the years. We had, we had officers, and we listed them. We decided all of a sudden they couldn't do this anymore, and uh, they, they were released from the Air Force. They weren't court martialed, they weren't shot, they weren't in the district. You go do something, go sell shoes, that's what you need to do, something like that. But I, but I think really, uh, realistically, the chances of something happening like that in the movies is so slim that it just couldn't happen. There were lots of practice. We practiced and practiced and practiced and yes, sir. I'll tell you a story about part of that. When, uh, when I was at Grand Forks, I was the senior standardization crew. That's the senior crew in the wind. That's the one that checked all the other crews. And in 1967, we went through the biggest revision of the emergency order procedures ever been done. Before that, in, in Benham investments, it was pretty simple. You get the message, you go to war, you stuck the keys in the lock, you armed all 10 of your missiles, you keep turning all 10 went away. Starting in uh, one, one January 1968, we had to go in and figure out these missiles launched, these don't launch, these launch to this target, to this target. We got a key turn 17 times, it was very complex. <coughs> we were sitting in the trainer two days after Christmas going through the checklist. It was wing commander and me and, and our crew. And we get to a point in the checklist and it was a procedure in those days called the whole procedure, where if, if we had a nuclear attack, we'd stop launching for a while because we didn't want to launch the missiles were coming in because they were blowing the missiles as they go out the side of So we, we, we start the hole. We go to the, the post hole procedure and we start launching again. And the, the checklist tells you to launch everything. Yeah, we didn't execute everything. But the checklist said launch everything. So I launch everything. And the wing commander said, You can't do that. I said, Colonel said, it says to, it's wrong. He called the division commander in that afternoon and they went through it again. And that general came down to me and said, Captain, why did you launch all your missiles? You, you weren't executed. He said, sir, read the checklist. Our wing commander hopped on an airplane the next morning and flew down to Omaha with, with those checklists, walked into the six sacks office personally and said, my wing will not go on alert in one January unless you fix this. And they fixed it. <laughs> So things like that happen, and you, you check it over and over and over and over again. I, and I, I'm one of those two, you know, in seven, eight, nine years ago we had problems in, in the missile force you read about in the news. Part of the problem is that today's attitude is different than it was in our day. Uh, people don't feel the same way about things like checklists, about training, about evaluation. Different, different attitude. They think they can do it other ways. I don't think they can. So, How you doing, sir? Great presentation. Uh, dovetailing off what this gentleman said, uh, I watched the great uh, documentary, but I also read the book Command and Control, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with Very it. Very much so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you've mentioned some of the incidences where we can misinterpret, you know, enemies' intentions, but what happens, you know, when we ourselves, you know, 
can almost annihilate ourselves. I mean, I'm talking about the Arkansas, what is it, Damascus, Arkansas, where they had that Titan II, yeah. where there was a mishap with a maintenance crew because there was only one nut that could turn uh, something they needed to fix. Yeah. And uh, essentially the bolt fell down the silo and opened a puncture inside the fuel uh, to, the, to the missile and it started an, uh, an immediate you know, threat yeah. uh, where the silo blew up but due in part to the fact that the nuclear portion of the missile wasn't armed, you know, it landed about 200 feet from it. And there's been like multiple incidences where we've had uh, planes take off with nuclear weapons, things like that. So uh, I understand that we're not in, in the same Cold, mind, cold War mindset that we were uh, during your time, but how do we, you know, stress the dangers of it now, uh, you know? Hope that made sense. I got you. I, I got very wrong with him, but Eric, Eric came to see me before he wrote it. He was sat on my front deck for about six hours talking about the only way to book out missiles, which is a good topic. And we talked back and forth several times after that. He came to one of our meetings and talked about it. And it's, it's a very good book. Um, a lot of people in that book I know very well, like John Mosier, the commander at Little Rock, and he's a good one. Uh, let me talk about the nuclear part first. The reason, the reason that that explode when it popped out of the silo and blew a mile away, is that we design our nuclear weapons with so many safeguards that they've got to go through certain specific events before they will arm. And that didn't do that. You know, an RV on a missile, a warrior on a missile, has to accelerate at a certain G-force going up for a certain length of time. <coughs> it's got to decelerate at a certain G-force going down for a certain length of time before it arms. And that never happened. You can't do that with popping one out of the silo. Uh, we, we had a problem. We had a problem off and on in the early days, but it wouldn't do it real world sometimes when we were supposed to. You know, again, it's, uh, we over we overdo the safe code. Um, we have so many things to make sure we don't have an accident. We now call them safe nuclear weapons. We're buying new warheads for, Venom, for the new Venomman replacement for the, for the safer warheads than what we have right now, and they're safer because of things like that. Um, they're still the same today, and of course the same attention that we had to make sure we don't make new mistakes. It's just a little different way to do things than we did in my day. Uh, they, they're very careful about it. I mean, Two-man policy is still in effect for everything. Two officer policy, all those things. And everything is checked over and over. It's just a, it's a little different than it was when the mayor was around. Sir, um, <clears throat> you were talking about the, uh, the maintenance um, of the missiles was at a pretty um, so you were just learning pretty much how to yeah. operate the missile force. Now, what percentage of those missiles, had we needed to launch, do you think would have made it or the other way? And how many would not have gone? I know from my experience in, in Type 1 and Atlas that uh, we, we did the Operation Reds inspection. We tested that. You were on the Sakai G team and ran a launch countdown every missile, every squadron every, every year. Only two squadrons passed all lives during the three years of Titan One. That's, that's, that's a pass rate was 67 percent. That meant that we were less successful than that. Atlas F never passed an all lives. Atlas D did, I think. But they weren't very good. We knew that, but they were new. And you know, we might have gotten them better over the long term. But Miniman came along, and Titan Two came along, and McNamara said, "We don't need those old ones anymore." So we didn't. I was amazed. I was. I went to a conference in 1963 in a lieutenant and then the Force base in the maintenance office to talk about phasing out Atlas D and Atlas E and maybe Atlas F. And we were told there, we've got to keep type one. It's a better system. And it wasn't really good at the volume. Two weeks later, we get to notice everything's coming down. Because they just, as I mentioned, 800 people to maintain nine missiles. It took more people to maintain our nine missiles in, in Mount Home and to maintain 150 Metamat missiles at Grand Four. And a whole lot more work. I mean, everything, everything moved in this system. I mean, nothing was, nothing was solid, nothing was fixed. It was, it was, it was pulleys and levers and cables and fluids and everything. Nothing was compatible. To give an example, liquid oxygen interaction almost everywhere. The elevator in Titan One used ethylene glycol as the fluid hydraulic fluid. Definitely live football and mixed with liquid oxygen goes down. So you're raising a missile above ground, pumping liquid, liquid glycol, which leaks all the time. 
lifting a vessel with 16,000 gallons of liquid oxygen. It's amazing we didn't blow one of those up. We did, we did blow up three hours. So, so it, it, it just, McNamara made a smart decision there, by the way. We might have gotten it right eventually, but um, let, me, let me tell you a little side story on this whole thing, too. I learned later. The Soviets, during the crisis, and I learned this in an article, I wrote an article about this, kind of like this briefing, for the adults and the atomic scientists. And they had another article by a Soviet missile He was on alert, and I think he said he was in uh, Kajak, somewhere in way up west, east. And he said, they sat there, and you know, their missiles in those days were hypergallic, like our type 2. Hypergallic means that you get oxidizer and fuel, and once you mix them, they light by themselves, and it goes bang automatically. Our Titan II, we stored both in the missile all the time. They couldn't do that. They couldn't solve the corrosion problem of storing those two fuel, these liquids in the missile. So they couldn't load those until right before launch. And the article said, we knew in the human crisis, if we loaded those two, those two uh, liquids, either we had to launch those missiles or we were gone. I and mean, within a few hours, they corrode themselves through and they leaks all the place and they blow up. So we, we didn't load them luckily, they said. If we loaded the missile, we'd go to war. We had to, so, because we had to launch our missiles. So, uh, no different attitude than this thing. Charlie, Mike Winter is from Air Force Association, yeah. and along with my comrades here, of which you know, Tom actually flew the RV 47s mm -hmm. uh, during the AQ missile crisis. We came on a little after, and it was just part of the history. And I think we overlapped a little and sat in 88 hours at Ellsworth on the looking glass. Yeah. The second night of alert, D1 turned upside down on fire, so it was the real world. Yeah. Uh, the question I have for you about the, the Cold War, some, I don't know whether it was during uh, ROTC training or at some point on active duty, but I had heard that the northern tier bases, uh, ones that you didn't mention, you know, uh, Grand Forks and uh, Minot and Fort Smith and KI Sawyer, that those were a response to the Cuban Missile Crisis. And of course, they couldn't have been stood up in a month and it didn't make any sense, but maybe that that was a kind of a uh, you know, in case there's something like this should happen again, we need something that's out of range of medium range missiles. But I've never heard that anywhere else, and I've tried to research it. So, what was the hit? Why did we get those far northern tier bases? Air Force, Minot, Glasgow, a few others, were any best command bases in this They were built back in the 50s for fighters, F 102s, F 106s, some kind of fighter. That's all in here initially. <coughs> Grand Forks became a SAC base about 1963, I think. The mine out was moved before that. So they were, they, the reason the Bennett man was there was that you wanted Bennett man as far inland as possible to make it tougher for the Soviets to get to attack our side. So they were put inland because of that. Um, there's, a, there's a story about a, a general sitting with a piece of string and a pencil and stretching it out on a map and deciding where the bases would be, and that's, that's why they kind of made and those bases, you know, those two bases, when I got to Grand Forks in 1965, they were just finishing building some of the new housing, and they had a lot of the old ABC facilities still. So we're, uh, one, one good example is all the bases have a big block house, the old SAGE system, which was a semi-automatic semi ground environment. That system came in about 1959. That was a big radar system for air defense. And that, that was the approach. That became our headquarters, that building. That, that system lasted about two years and was gone. But they, were, they were there as their defense force. So it wasn't, they were there before the Cuban crisis. You mentioned uh, that there was a U-2 uh, plane shot down in the pilot killed. How did the Soviets accidentally fire on that? I read some articles recently about the fact that the, um, the I guess the, the air defense Unit commander didn't get proper authority. He was told not to do anything, and he, he did anyway. So there were some articles about 10 years ago about that. About it. They, they didn't really mean to do it, but they did. But it was, it was a case of command and control. They lost, they lost authority a little bit. Colonel, was the uh, CIA involved in the Cuban Missile Crisis? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Would you tell a gentleman who thinks about insanity what the PSYOP was? You mean, you mean the single integrated operational plan? Well, the PSYOP, I guess it still is, is um, the very detailed nuclear war plan for all nuclear systems. And it's, it's a joint effort. You know, it's, it's done now, it's at ground in Omaha. Uh, when I was there, there was 
sacked the Air Force with the Joint Strategic Targeting and Planning Staff was, was commanded by the commander of SAC, the vice commander was an admiral. They did the targeting. And people assigned to that were not part of SAC. They were part of the targeting staff. Their job was to lay the force, basically. They would, they would uh, take all the targets in the Soviet Union, take all the weapons. Uh, my job for a while was to tell them how many missiles it took to kill one target, because it, sometimes it took more than one. And their job was to lay off the side. And the initial side was very simple. It was, we have to go to war, we launch everything. Within two years, it evolved into all the options we have and the varieties and things like that. I want to table off this uh, comment, thank you, sir, about sanity. Raven Rock, uh, I, there was a, a talk at the National Archives, someone wrote a book about. Uh, that facility, specifically because they found a badge on the street that was dropped by mistake that said this is where you'll be going with somebody that was a senator or a congressman or whatever. And there were talks about people that said, I, I'm not going there. My family's here. My family's there. My, you know, I'm the only one that personally can go there. So the question to you is, are people that were in silos, what was the contingency after you launched all the weapons? What was the plan that, you know, if everybody launched everything, what were you going to do then? Obviously, your paycheck would be difficult coming in and, and finishing your, your master's degree uh, as part, you were promised as part of signing up. So I'm just curious from your perspective, what was plan B after DEF CON 001? Well, let me go first back to, I should mention during the talk, I'll give a question. At Mount Home in 1962, something happened where it made us. Uh, a lot of the families took off and left the base. The bomber families, you know, the, the non-Muslim families, I should say. Uh, well, we had a lot of people at Mount Home who were from up part of the country. Uh, and they went back to family. They packed up their campers and their cars and they, they left. I mean, the base became a, a ghost town. They went to a safer place. Others took their campers and went up in the mountains, we say. Uh, Carol was eight and, a half, nine, eight and a half months pregnant at the time with our son. Uh, we were living in a, a four-story, a two-story quarters building. <clears throat> she had an experience happen uh, the second day. She had a doctor up above us uh, who was crazy, and so was his wife. Sadly, she killed herself uh, in California. Carol, I'm at work. She heard this thumping around upstairs over our apartment and crying, and she went upstairs, and he was going to jump off the second floor balcony and put himself. Uh, it probably wouldn't have happened if he jumped off. She was smart enough to call the hospital and say, come get this crazy doctor, and they did. We never saw him. But uh, another thing happened is we, another family called her and said, we don't have a shelter, so we can stay in your basement. Well, we were going to assign shelters for the we had, we had a, a cellar in our basement, and there was a list of who was assigned to our cellar in the time. So we would stay there, apparently. Now, how good is that in a nuclear attack? Not great. But back to your real question. In a Miniman and Lost Control Center, there is an escape tunnel. It goes up this way about 45 degrees. It's filled with sand. It's got a big heavy steel door on the bottom end of it. The top is probably under the concrete or the asphalt in the parking lot. You should joke about that. You can quite get up there and figure it out. We had the same thing in that was in Titan. You had an escape tunnel. Uh, your first concern is that if there's a nuclear attack, is that sand turned to glass? Who knows? The second thing was, it was the deputy's job to dig it out, not the commander. He gets up there and takes his, his big bolt off and his 500 pound door falls down but he's had to change and he digs the sand out. We had a survival kit. We had, uh, like the aircraft, we had a folding stock 22 rifle and some bullets. We had sea rations and we had water bottles and we had blankets and things like that. We were told we could survive with that stuff out in the plains of North Dakota if we had to. Uh, but we also were told we could stay in the LCC for probably 60 days and have enough air down there without digging out. And had, we had food and water down there too. But, you know, you, you, you talk about that and say, if we go to war, there's nothing to dig out. There, there will have been so many nuclear explosions around our 150 missile silos and our 15 lost control centers that this could be blowing for a long, long time. So, you know, why not be a factor? But we trained for it. I never did. I, I never dug the sand out. I wasn't about to. <laughs> but, it, but it was designed that way. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Just two questions, if I may. Did you allude to the fact that we had B-52s during the Cuban Missile Crisis flying in orbital alert? And if so, roughly how far were they from their targets? 
in terms we, of time. We had it in 1962, and we did it until 1968, I think, Chrome Dome, which was airborne alert, and it, there were up to 18 airplanes, 18 total airborne all the time with nuclear weapons on board. And they flew up, you know, they had different, different orbits. They flew somewhere in their, their attack profile, close enough to the Soviet Union to be able to attack fairly quickly, but far enough outside the pro profile not to be not to bother the Soviets. But they knew they were there. Okay. During Cuba, they went 18 airplanes to 65. So they had 65 fully loaded, and I think, I don't know, they carried four weapons apiece, I think, I'm not sure. I mean, they carried more than one, okay. Plus you had two hound dog whistles. You, know, so you had a lot of a lot of stuff in the airplane. But you had 65 of them on airborne alert continuously for about three weeks. Okay. And the other question I had is you're familiar with the voice reporting system on the missiles in Minuteman 2? Versa, yeah. Right. Is it true that in the early days the Versa switch was actually an enable switch? Uh, the early Minuteman enable switches were 10 vital switches, one under each light for each missile. So each missile had its own. Its own. Without the enable code. And they were, they were safe. There was no enable code in the early days. Now, it, it, there was a switch later on, and uh, this has come out, with Bruce Blair especially talked about this, he's wrong. Um, we, we came out with a new launch enable system that had a code in the, in the 1960s, <clears throat> and that's what's still in effect, basically. It, it's a switch that sits over in the in case of Minuteman 2, rather than up here on the console. It's got a rotating switch, and it's got code wheels that you're not dialing a code. That code comes as part of the, uh, the National Command Authority's message. You, you don't have any execution, you get the code you put in. You can't, if the crew key turns without that code, nothing happens. Nothing gets, gets made. And Bruce came up with the idea that we use zero, 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 therefore the system didn't do anything. The reason we use zero, 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 zero is that we hadn't finished putting the system in yet. We had a whole lot of silo sites, LCC, that didn't have that yet. And you couldn't have a system where some of them did and some of them didn't and go to war. So you had to wait until everybody was finished before you could by using that system. That was, um, but the, the initial, you know, I started in Minuteman, and uh, you had these 10 toggle switches, and they were safety wired. You couldn't turn them on, right? But you had to, you definitely had a pair of covers. You had to cut the safety wire on all 10 switches, and then enable. So you couldn't do it accidentally. Now, in Titan 1, you could. Uh, I was, one of my good friends was on alert one day at Mount Home, and, he was burned out bulb with one of the switches, and he said, well, I've got to fix that. And he changed the bulb, and he pushed the button. And the countdown clock started, and I started loading locks. <laughs> so I actually tried to lock flow with the missile. So, and that was early days before we learned about safeguards. Yeah. Uh, one thing I'd like to add is, uh, our friends in the Navy lost the missiles that were coming from the Soviet Union to Cuba. They were surveilling and they lost them. Colonel Power came to the 55th Marine at Fort Air Force Base. I was a crew member there on RB-47. And he got everybody in the uh, theater. They stood up there and said that our friends in the Navy lost it. You guys are going to find it. And our people did find it. We we had airplanes that were actually, had a lot of cameras in them, RB-47. Flew out of several locations on the East Coast. Went out over the Atlantic, turned around and came back. Every time you saw a ship, you went down. I flew a couple of those missions. Took pictures, you know, and, it, and it was actually found. That, that way. The other point I want to make is, <clears throat> Chrome Dome, and when the B-52s are on alert, they would go through a line. There was a line around the sign of Soviet block. And they would fly to that line in orbit, and they were in a close enough proximity that the, the Soviets would know that they were there. Okay, but they couldn't pass that line until they got a go code. And they would get a go code, which was a classified code over the high frequency network, which they had the one-time pass that we thought to use to determine that. So it was uh, it was well controlled uh, that way. And I don't think there were any, as far as I know, there weren't any B-52s flying around Cuba. I don't think so. No, no, no. There were, we had three B-47s flying, but two of them were going opposite directions around during the daytime and one in the top of the back and forth. They, 
And our mission was to listen in to the sites, and if any of the sites, the proper radars came up in a firing sequence, we would immediately send that information to the ground, and they had airborne Navy fighters that would go and bomb that particular site. So we were ready, and, and yeah. the point I think I'm trying to make is we were ready to sh we showed them the force. I don't think we were the only ones to do it. I don't think anybody wanted to do it. And I can say, in my years in the Pentagon, uh, I spent at the Rock, I spent uh, probably at least five times up there on exercise. The people knew about the Rock and just keep it in there. Uh, you go into an exercise there, and after about two days of exercise, you really believe you're in a war. You know, yeah, yeah. It, really, it really gets into you. You're yeah. going to 12 hours a day. Yeah. And, and uh, one particular uh, exercise, I uh, I played the uh, op step of the Air Force. The Air Force, the, the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the Four Stars, the op steps of the Three Stars. And in the exercise, the uh, Air Force One Star played the Chief, and I played the op step. And I can remember we went, uh, I was involved in the middle of the night, the meetings we had of all the service options in the GS meeting room about how you would, you know, if somebody wanted to launch a tactical nuclear missile. I mean, we agonized on that unbelievably. There was a lot of, we don't want to do this unless we really bad. If we really looked at it, people really looked at it, and I think that tells you what we can see at the first party level. And then you have to go to the president and all that kind of stuff. I, I don't know how the flow is today, but when I was there, it went from the Joint Chiefs of Staff to the Chair and through the Secretary of Staff to the President. I, I kind of glossed over the B 47. I mentioned we had 168 of them that were specially equipped. As he's talking about. And I, uh, I gave a presentation in Denver one time, and it was a uh, mission B 47 pilot, and then an alert in St. Paul. It was a staff sergeant, former staff sergeant, was controller at Ford in the 5th Wing in the command post during the takeoff. He had some good storage. There also was a lieutenant, maybe a lieutenant, who was at Guantanamo during the whole crisis. And he had some good storage too. So it was amazing storage. But, um, I mean, say one more thing. Um, I spent, I got sent to Europe as a colonel. I've been in SAC most of my career. Got sent over in ground launch cruise missiles, which was a new experience for missile guys. And I learned very quickly that. SAC plays games, but Safety plays games with bangs. Uh, we got over there and went through their type of valves, which are wartime exercises, and you had to you had to pass one every year. Uh, my job was to defend, defend the base, keep the runways open, keep the, so the fighters could fly in case of two wings over there. They use real real tear gas and real gas grenades and real explosive devices and you'll you be sitting in the command post, all of a sudden the power goes off, the place fills with smoke. You gotta put your gas mask on and, and run out. And I got outside my car sitting in a bunker, except there was a 500 pound bomb laying behind it, so I couldn't drive my car. They play for real when they do it. Like you, you forget it's an exercise after a while, which is good. Mm -hmm. Why you here? A question. Um, there's, I guess in the 80s, there was, in, in Russia, uh, someone that saw a reflection off clouds that provided a false uh, reading that, and, and there was an officer, I guess, that decided not to push a button. Well, and, and I'm curious if you ever met anybody from that perspective. Of it. We assume our systems are all secure, we, yeah. we cut wires and things, but what they had may not have been so, you know. They did, that one, they did, they misinterpreted a, a, a NATO exercise, Able Archer which was a command post only exercise. I was in I was in NATO at the time. I was down in cruise missiles. We didn't play in it. I mean, we were a nuclear system. We didn't play in exercise. It was a command post. But somehow the command and control system in the Soviets misinterpreted some of the signals they heard from Germany and places like that and thought it was a real, let's go to war. Petrov apparently was smart enough to jump in and realize it wasn't. It, it was a movie about that. It was not a, a documentary. I got, I got asked, um, Several years ago, uh, the BBC called me and wanted to talk about Eagle Archer. And I said, I don't know anything about it. We wouldn't have talked anyway. So they came over. We spent three days in the uh, Minuteman Missile National Historic Site in South Dakota, the real missile site that's a museum. It was one of those worth of site. Three days filming in that site. They asked all kinds of questions about Minuteman. 
they kept asking about, about Abel Archer, and I said, that was, that was all NATO command post and the Soviets. So don't, don't ask us about that. But it, it did, it was a case where they came pretty close to doing something. And there have been several documentaries on TV about that in the last four or five years. Isn't that his name is Petro, I mean, that, I've seen, I've seen him interview a few times. A couple of interesting things. Uh, uh, we have a document that stated June of 1962, signed by the Deputy Commander of the National Security Agency, and it's the Continuity of Operations Plan for the NSA. So where would you guess that the NSA would have gone if they had evacuated Fort Meade because of the, because of the tactical situation? And the answer is, they would go to a place in Warrington, Virginia called Ben Hill Farm Station. <laughs> and they would have been in a wing on the other side of this building about 100 yards over here. Uh, also, we hunted up the continuity plan for the White House. And there was Jackie Kennedy and the kids. Now, we know from research that they were at the White House. But Jackie Kennedy used to hang out at a farm that Kennedy's at least just north of here. So Jack calls her on the phone and says, you should come back to the White House. More of a bit going on. You should be down here for that. So we know where Jack and the kids are there at the White House. But you can't have the president calling his wife at the farm to be your continuity plan. So we went hunting for the actual continuity plan for the White House. And what it said is these four buses load up the first families, cabinet secretaries, down to D.C., go to the Virginia, I-95, Quantico. And they would go on the Quantico base. And the plan says from Quantico, they will go to an undisclosed location. Well, if you come over here on a weekday and stand in front of the museum, you can hear the rifle ranges in Quantico. They're that close. So if the NSA was here, there's a good chance that Jackie would have been here, and she would have been staying in the inn over here. So there's some interesting things going on there, and, and they're happening right around us here, right where we're at, yeah. in these buildings that we're in right now. So when we come over to the museum, we'll show you some fun documents. At Site R, which is the rock, there is a whole section up above the PCS meeting room. It's a whole apartment there that for the president to play. Everything is in a small spot. And it was kept. Uh, looked at all the time by an Air Force three star who worked over the White House. And, and there were other places around the country that they had places like the Major Group or something like that. Yeah. 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 I'd just like to address uh, back to the insanity again that uh, the way we got there started in the Hoover Commission report of 1952. Because you may recall, something happened to us a few years earlier called Pearl Harbor. And when Russia got its nukes five years before we thought they did, the president asked for a report of what should we do. The Hoover Commission laid out the idea of massive retaliation that evolved the mutual assured destruction. All of this stuff was ice cold step by step by step by step to maintain the freedom and the national security of the United States. What all these people did was designed to protect and defend our nation. It wasn't insanity, it was ice cold. So I want to talk about insanity again. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it was a, a National Public Radio uh, oh, yeah, thing on the source. weekend. Um, or something like that, maybe. A, a, they talked about, okay, it all goes up to the president. And the president makes the final decision, and we assume a civilian versus the government versus the military uh, control this system will, will work, unless we have someone that's insane in the office. Um, and there's no law that's in place in regards to what controls were. The president says, this is what we're doing. That's the control system. I, I, I don't know. And, and the reason I'm bringing this up, you may look this up online, it was someone that was in, in uh, uh, a silo who had questioned that aspect. Well, before he decided to, to proceed with his mission in the Air Force, what he asked that question, how is this security system set up 
for a president who makes a decision? What are the checks and balances? If there's anything you can elaborate on that perspective, either back then or today? I, I can't tell you much about the check and balance at the top level. I do know that General Pike, who is now in just the name of the new deputy, uh, as a deputy chairman of Joint Chiefs, he's commander of STRATCOM. He made a comment last year about the fact that he will follow a lawful order. And he's the guy who sends out the messages that go through STRATCOM. So, you know, read that how you want. That's all he said. He says, if we go to war, it'll be a lawful order. I guarantee you that. So that's all I know. Uh, the other one, interesting enough, I sat on an awful discharge board uh, back in the early 80s. And I think it was my night. It was a young captain who said, I can't go to war because I can't trust the president to make the right decision. And we had a process in those days where if, if you couldn't do your job, and he signed a doc document in training and said he could. That's one thing you had to do. The first day of training in January, you sign a document saying, I understand my, my new job as a missionary. I may be required to go to nuclear war. I may be required to launch these missiles and kill thousands of people and so and so. And he signed that. And then he got to my night in the wintertime. And, uh, and that's the picture he And he, he uh, you know, an officer discharge board is very much like a, like a trial. There are three judges, basically, three officers, three senior officers, all one of them. The judge is kind of a legal authority, and he, he hired us a legal lawyer, which is always done because they don't know what they're doing. He always better off even a military lawyer, but they don't know that. But he took the stand, not under oath, and he could do that too. He could take the stand and not be under oath, which also is stupid because every time I saw it happen, they get carried away, and they're smarter than these colonels are. They're going to tell you what really goes on. And he said, Well, I, I didn't mean President Reagan. I mean, it wasn't Reagan, it was Reagan. It was Reagan. I didn't mean President Reagan. I mean, I'm not sure I can trust any other president. So, I'm going to make you a list of error, but it depends on your president. And you, you get to decide. Well, yes, sir. I said, I mean, you do. I said, what, what, what would you rather do? I said, I'd rather go back to my old job. I was in social action. I was in the Philippines. So, you don't like North Dakota, do you? And that really was a problem. <laughs> we kicked him out. Right but there, there were cases of that, too. There was an NPR program about, a, I think, Captain a Major at Great Falls, Montana, the same way back in the earlier in the year. I had a deputy do the same thing. So there were, especially during Vietnam, there were several of them. And there were some later on too, and there still are today. That, that, yeah, that's fine. They're allowed to do that. You're allowed to go in, and, and there's no punishment. There's, there's a discharge board just because you've got a discharge. It's efficient. But there's no punishment. And it's a, it's a good conduct discharge, basically. It's just that they're, they're no longer put. They used to. What, what they did, the Grand Forks, the first one we had, we had a group called the Concerned Officers. They were good with anti Vietnam officers who would join the military. I found out from my nephew to avoid going to Canada or to prison. And they decided, the first one decided, I can't do this anymore. I want to do something else in the Air Force. Our wing commander was nice to him. He sent him down to March Air Force Base as a public affairs officer. The second guy came up with the same idea and walked in. That was my nephew. And the wing commander said, Wait a minute. These guys are doing this to get to other assignments. I'm not going to do that. He's going to say a second lieutenant at Grand Forks for a whole four years. That's what happened. They didn't kick him out. They didn't promote him. They just kept him a second lieutenant for four years. And that kind of got their attention. I mean, it's one thing if you're strong enough for your convictions about, I don't want to do it because of that. It's something else about, I don't want to be in this cold weather. And, and they were, you had both sides of that. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Let's give Charlie a round of applause. <laughs>